Now, the Imo State Government has queried a senior editor with the Imo Broadcasting Corporation, O.T. Vivian, for complaining over non-payment of her salaries and that of her colleagues. O.T., a lawyer, had on May 4th in a Facebook post pleaded publicly with the state government to pay them for the months of February, March and April of 2020. In a letter dated May 8th and signed by the Acting Director General of IBC, Osuchuku S.O.O.T. was issued a query for granting a press conference without approval from the government as a public servant with the sole aim of ridiculing and sabotaging the government. And to give us an update on this development is Plus TV Africa correspondent in Imo State, Joseph Oliver. Good morning, Oliver. Good morning. Now, what is the latest update on the matter of Vivian Oti? Uh, the latest update is that the government through the corporation has given her indefinite suspension. Oh, and what are, what are the people saying about this? I mean, you are on ground. Uh, what can you feel? What, what are you hearing? What's the uh, feeling out there around this development? Of course, the feeling, the feeling here is very, very sad because uh, uh, the woman in question just put to bed and she's demanding for her salary so that uh, she can be able to take care of her family. So posting that, uh, that uh, update on Facebook on of, uh, 5th of May, uh, uh, caused the, the state government to give her suspension. Yeah, uh, th that's what we know. Now, what's the likelihood that she would end up being sacked? Uh, or do you see a cordial resolution of this matter, looking at the way it has uh, escalated, if you like? Well, I interacted with the Commissioner for Information yesterday. So for now, there is nothing like a cordial relationship. Uh, uh, relationship between them because uh, the government said she, uh, after giving her query, she did not uh, show remorse in her reply. Mm. All right, thank you, Oliver, for your time there. We'll keep following up on that. Now, also joining us. On this and other matters affecting journalists at this time is the Director, International Press Centre, Lanry. Uh, good morning, Mr. Lanry. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Now, what's your reaction to the story of Vivian Oti? I believe you're following it. Well, it's uh, one of the sad experiences that journalists have been having because of uh, company. COVID-19 pandemic. We've already noted the fact that uh, so many journalists have been subjected to one form of harassment or the other. The other time, the state governor went to the essence of uh, saying that he was banning two journalists you know, from the state. So for us, it's, it's sad that uh, we keep having a recurrence of this kind of a development. And uh, we're going to be looking into greater you know, detail about what is happening most states, uh, with a view to taking a decision on what uh, steps we need to take. Mm. There are other reports also of broadcast stations, you know, struggling to survive the financial fallout of this pandemic and life becoming harder for journalists as a result. While some have been asked to stay at home, other salaries have been slashed by half. What are the implications here, especially now that, you know, their work is even more important, if you put it that way? But the, the, the implication is that uh, the ability of journalists to provide uh, credible information is being uh, undermined. And I feel that uh, ultimately the, the public is the loser because we have a, a pandemic which has led towards the World Health Organization called an infodemic. Now, within that infodemic, you have a lot of false information, a lot of fake news a lot of uh, misinformation and uh, disinformation. To that extent, the role of the conventional media becomes very important because uh, as trained journalists, as full-time journalists, we, our, our profession requires us to exercise the discipline of verification uh, for us to cross-check our facts. So it is the conventional media, as in newspapers, radio, and television, that could actually help the public to get correct information to correct false news and so on and so forth. Now, when that media is being handicapped, as it were, then it raises you know, a big uh, problem. And for me, this is the time for the society, for the government, to recognize the important place of the media 
during this crisis situation and also do something about it. So on the one hand, we, we call on media proprietors to, as much as possible, try not to neglect the welfare of the journalists. It's a very difficult period. Mm. No doubt about that. So we, we try to make that appeal to them. But again, we need to talk to government because government needs to see you know, media as business. Everybody now, they are talking about possible bailouts. Yeah. I feel that for the media, you don't even need to wait till the end of COVID-19 before you begin to talk you know, of a bailout because journalists are frontline men and women. The media is a frontline institution as far as this battle is concerned. You have the medical profession, you have the security agencies, and you have the media. These are the three groups of professionals that are out there on the field performing an important role. As I, would even, I would even say that that of the media is the most important because if doctors succeed in treating patients and they are discharged and the public do not know about it, then it will assume that nothing has been done. And you still know that there's a lot of disbelief as far as this COVID-19 is concerned. So to that extent, I, I felt that government itself needs to react proactively. Mm -hmm. One of the demands we've made, for example, is that for journalists who work in state media and who are engaged in, uh, the, in reporting COVID-19, they should be entitled to a special insurance package. And of course, there's no excuse for those who work in government media for them not to have their you know, salaries uh, paid. That is for those who work in government media. For the media as a whole, government needs to look at what we are doing. We are providing public enlightenment. We are providing education. So to that extent, I feel that the media should have some chunk of uh, the monies that have been raised or contributed or been you know, uh, allocated to the fight against COVID-19 because of the fact that we are playing that very, very important role. Mm -hmm. Obviously, COVID-19 is going to have implications you know for the media uh, things may never you know be the same again but you see we also have the collective bargaining process and what we're saying here is that where a media organization is facing economic difficulties as a result of this lockdown maybe we do not have uh, enough adverts and uh, there are uh, you know reduced patronage and the rest of them the what you then do really is also for you to uh, be open because for the media that demands transparency and accountability on the part of government, our proprietors will need to be transparent, to be open, to have a dialogue with their workers, with their professionals, mm -hmm. through their professional bodies. So say, this is where we are. This is what our books look like. These are the measures we have in mind. And then you could have a negotiation between the unions and the management All right. to reach some temporary agreements and say, OK, we'll let me do this. All right, so all right. a number of things that can be done rather than just uh, arbitrarily uh, dismissing or stopping the salaries of uh, ideal professionals, especially journalists. All right, Lanre, thank you very much for your time this morning. That's the much that we can take.